Listen to your dissatisfaction. It is trying to tell you something, so don't, like, brush it under the rug. And now... <laughs> aye, aye, aye. I'm the captain now. <laughs> Coming to you from the K2 Studios in San Diego, California. This I sounds know. great. You sound amazing. I always sound amazing. It's the world famous... Everybody sitting off like BFS. Chris and Christine Show. Hey, what's happening? How are you doing today? Thank you so much for being here. And I am Chris. And I'm Christine. And welcome to episode 177 of the Chris and Christine Show. Do, 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 do. Oh, fantastic. We are back again. Did you miss us? It is Christmas week. I know that you're hearing this after the fact, but it is Christmas week. We just celebrated Christmas. Hallelujah. I know. It's just been such a blur around here lately. You know, it feels weird that Christmas came so quickly. It feels like I thought it was just 2022 just the other day. And now it's like 2024. What happened? Almost. I mean, we're on the cusp of 2024, right? No, by the time this goes out, it will be already be 2024. Oh my gosh, you're right. It's like the first day of 2024, but we are recording this just a little bit early just so that we can enjoy the New Year's festivities. You know, it's funny about recording during the month of December, podcasting wise. A lot of shows take breaks. A lot of shows just don't even do episodes at all during December. We are, we are just the opposite. We are, we're doing we like were, seven. <laughs> but we weren't doing any episodes prior to December. And now we're doing all our episodes in December. So hallelujah, here you are. And Christine is on vacation. I am, you know, I love getting towards the holidays. And this year, the our vacation started just right before Christmas because Christmas fell on a Monday, which means that we had to work all the way through the end of the week. But I took off Friday because I had a personal day that I could use. Um, But I am on vacation until January 3rd. Which is about the time this episode comes out. So hallelujah. By the time you hear this at home, Christine is back to the normal grind. Back to work. Well, you know, I was wrapping up the work on the 22nd. That was my last day working in the office. And that was also my last day of working in my previous role in my prior department. Wait a second. Time out. You're saying previous as if you're doing something different now? Well, I will be starting in the new year, but as I was saying, the 22nd was my last day working in my previous role in my previous department. And I don't know if I had shared this publicly, but I got a job change. It was pretty surprising in uh, like October. I was pulled into a meeting and it's not because I'd done anything bad. It was actually well, because- that's good. Uh, yeah, it's because I'd actually done a lot that was good. But I was being moved into this brand new team, brand new division department that was being developed and um, doing work that we've never done before. Going where no man has gone before. Ooh, and uh, Star Trek music. Going. I know, right? And so it's like a, a high profile position, a new leadership role. Fancy pants. And I know. And I have a team that I'm going to be leading from now on. Look at you like the coach. Of I a know, team. right? You go to so, circle or what? <laughs> Basically, yes. But, you know, it's interesting because wrapping up the the work that I was doing was more than just wrapping up a couple of projects. It was wrapping up work that I've been working on for like seven years. And then on uh, Thursday after, because I was working remotely on Thursday and that was my last day in the office, I was like, oh, I need to go take my secretary her Christmas present. And so... I texted her, her name's Kathy, and I was like, hey, do you mind if I just drop by your Christmas gift before the holidays? I'd really like to get it to you. And I always, she's so good to me and she's such a good assistant. We've worked together for, I think, six years, seven, six years now, five or six years. And she's she's been working with the organization since she was 18 years old. She's retiring at the end of June. So she spent her entire career with one organization working her way up. She's very, very good at what she does and just the kindest person. And I was, after she's like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And I was like, oh, remind me of where you live again. And I was getting ready to go. And I was like, 
oh my gosh, like I'm not just giving her her Christmas gift. I'm like, I'm breaking up with her. I was like, because she doesn't get to move with me into my new role. Wait, you, wait, wait, I thought you were the captain of the ship. I thought you were in charge. You can bring anybody you want. No, I couldn't bring anybody. When they're classified support staff, they have to stay with the division. Is it so, like because you're union or their union or something goofy well, like I'm that? I'm not union, but they are. Yes. Right. That's and what it so is. And okay. so she stays with her division, which means that it was like, I'm leaving her. And we, we've developed a very close like work slash friendship relationship. And I was like, oh my word. So here I was taking this gift over to her and it was like a couple of restaurant gift cards that we had plus a like a little basket with like chocolate covered pretzels and a little candle Ooh, and things like that. And then I realized like, oh my gosh, this totally isn't enough to thank her for everything she's done for me. So I was like, what else can I add to this? How much bigger can I make this? So I went down the street and I stopped at Starbucks and I got her one of the fancy travel um, coffee mugs. Is it like a Stanley cup? No, not the Stanley ones. It's like the skinny, like the, the travel coffee mugs that are the really nice ones from Starbucks. Okay. Okay. Awesome. You know, like the ones you fill up for me before I leave when I, take my coffee oh, on the go. Oh, but they're like a metallic metal yes, or something. Yes, and they're, they're skinnier. Aluminum. Okay. Yeah, they oh, fit yeah. the cup holder. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I went and I got her one of those and then they had like the little bags of chocolate covered almonds and then I got oh, her nice. like a couple Wait, of- Starbucks sells those? Yeah. Oh, in, nice. like the little tiny container. So I like got two of those because they'd fit inside and then I was like getting her gift cards like $40 in Starbucks gift cards. <laughs> it's like you're um, uh, compensating for something, aren't you? No, no. I just felt bad. Like, well, yeah, that's what like, it is. Here I'm leaving her and, you know, she's done such great things for me. And I was like, okay, so I have to go a bit bigger for this Christmas gift for her. And now, so, is she going to be okay? I mean, is she. She's fine. She already, they reassigned another manager to work with her. Um, and so for her, it's like it's her last six months before she retires. And it's like, whatever. It's not like she's leaving though. At the end of six months, she's retiring. Oh. For her career. Oh. So. How old is your secretary? Is she like retirement age? Yeah. I mean, young oh, retirement. For some reason, I just imagine her being like 25. I like, just I, said she'd worked her entire career since yeah, she was 18. I know. I know. For some reason, when I think of the word assistant or secretary, I just think of like someone who's like in their 20s. Well, that's very stereotypical. I'm, well, hey, I'm not saying she's not, not a secretary. She's my administrative professional. That's, co- that's not a fancy mine. name for a secretary. Really. No, no, she's like uh, she runs programs and projects. And anyways, much higher. She does a lot. Oh, I would not say she doesn't. I'm okay. not saying that at all. Anyway, so saying, she's been with the sir, organization okay, for okay. Al- for almost 35 years. That's crazy. That's a long time. Yeah. So, or 40 years, I don't know. 40 don't, years, wow. I don't know how old she is. But anyways, the point is, uh, it's been like an interesting holiday season because I had to like go through this transition right before Christmas. And then I came home and I had the next day off and I was kind of like in a funk and I couldn't figure out why. And I was like, oh, because for me, so much is changing in the middle of the holidays when we're like, you know, celebrating so much. I'm kind of grieving that I don't have this other team that I've been working with for so long. And I don't know if I told you this, but when I first moved to San Diego, I moved the day after Christmas. No way. Really? Eight years ago. Was there a lot of traffic that day when you moved down here? No, but it was eight years ago. And so it's like closing this chapter because I've worked in the same building within the same cubicle. I just barely moved six months ago. Yeah, but ago. you were working from home a lot of times though too. So, But my point is it's a pattern, familiarity. Of course, same, of course. Same general body of work for eight years and now it's like this mega change. And I don't think I realized how much it was affecting me. Well, it's like with anything, you know, um, change, I, I can't handle change very well. And I, I've had some changes in my career um, nothing major since you and I've been together. Like right before we, we met, I was on the day shift and I did that for a year, full year. I did that. 
And it was a brutal change for me. It was almost as if I was working for a completely different company, even though it was the same company and same job, really, but completely different. So maybe there's like, as what it's like for you, it's same job, same company, same, you know, paycheck, same name of the paycheck, I guess. But, but it's going to feel different because yeah, I'm going to totally. be in a completely different building, a completely new division, a new leadership new, new structure. New faces, new people, right? Yeah, new people that we, there's 24 of us that have been brought together to work at, to build this brand new team. Uh, we are in a completely different setting, new setup, new, like everything. We're not even going to have our own dedicated desks. We're going to have shared desks that we rotate in one day to two days a week that we share space Wait with other a people. Second. Time out, time out, time out, time out. You're telling me that you have to share the same desk with somebody else. So the day they are there, they're in the desk. And the day you are there, you are in that desk. Yeah. It's kind of like, kind of like with me with the truck is that I, obviously the trucks run 24 seven and I can't be there 24 seven. So the days I'm not there or the hours I'm not there, somebody else is using it. Exactly. So same kind of concept. The worst part about that is that all your presets on the radio are changed <laughs> to something else. It's yeah. We were just talking about that in our leadership team meeting before the winter break that we're going to have to have common working agreements with the people that we share desks with around like what's get, what gets left there. Um, and I think what's hard for me is my desk has always been a space that's like very inviting to me. I have pictures of you and the boys up because. Well, are you allowed to put them up now? We're not going to. We're going to have nothing personal at our desk. It's going to be you, you, know, you and the laptop and like, that's it. Yeah. It's going to be, wow. It's going to remind me of that time we were in the airport at um, Dallas and they had that little office station where I said, bring my laptop up and do right. some podcast work. And it was like right there. It was just a basic little like workstation with some plugs and a space for your laptop and a little cubicle hole you know, area. And that was pretty much it. So that's going to be like your office. Literally. So they call it the hotel concept where it's like check in, check out. But the exciting thing is because I'm on this new team and because I've demonstrated such high levels of productivity in remote working, I've been allowed to have input into setting my schedule. And so starting in the new year, I'm going back down to working in person one day a week and working remotely four what? days a week. So the only time you have to go to the office to see this like prison cell of a cubicle, you're going to be there only one day? Because I'm so productive working remotely. That's fantastic. So here in your real office, I, I call us the real office, by the way, the yeah. one at the house here. It's decked out very nice. You have two massive computer monitors, stuck in 4K. Christine's like decked out, you know? I know. And she just plugs your MacBook in there and it's like, ta-da. It's like a content creator's dream. It really is. And so she has that here with all of her regular stuff. So when you go to the office, so when you do go there, it's going to be like, like staying in a hotel. You know, it's not all your, when you go to a hotel, you don't put your pictures out and stuff. You usually just go there, do your thing and leave. So that's going to be like you're going to do. It is. So my question for you is, Given that I'm going to be working from home more and my work from home space is really in the center of our house, it's up, I call it like the crow's nest. Yeah, Christine's in the control booth. I know, but we have my studio out in the backyard and I know we're not in busy season right now. So I guess the question is, do you want me to move my whole setup oh, out no. in the backyard? No, no. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've always suggested that you can go very portable and make a cutesy little office in there with a with a monitor like the one on the wall here that can kind of like fold out and swing around and stuff and hook up to your computer and stuff. And you can like have clients out there and show them designs and different things. You can physically be doing stuff. You can still work out there like you do here, but you can do the same exact thing out there if you set it up correctly and cutesy like, of course, and stuff like that. But the nice thing about uh, going portable, like we we both are portable, you know, computers, you know, with our MacBook Pros, is that we can take them in different locations, plug them into different setups, and you can do it with work here at the office, outside, even in this room, you can plug it in. So ha having that ability to be portable gives you limited choices on where you physically can set up an office for that day, not just, not just forever, but for, just for that moment. Well, I was just wondering because I know that you know, in the old house, I did have a dedicated space where I could close the door, 
you could go and do whatever you wanted and play the music. Here, when I work from home, you have to stay pretty quiet during the day. Oh, like a mouse. But that's what I'm wondering. Do you want me to relocate? Well, listen, I don't want you to leave ever. But so if if it's just one day a week where you're home on on whatever day it is. Honey, I'm home four days a week now. I'm sorry. sorry. If there's only one day a week you're gone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Reverse that. Reverse that. One day a week that you're not here, you're gone in the office, uh, whatever day, day that is, I will use all my loudness and music <laughs> and crank, crank up the sound system that day probably. But it's okay. I love having you here in the house. I love I love knowing where you are. And I always well, like- Well, that track, sounds controlling. <laughs> a little bit. I like, I like to keep it on a leash. And I um, I always track Christine's um, iPhone, the iPhone this tracker. That's scary. And I always know where she is at all times. And the only, the only funny, the only thing I, time I really track your phone the most is when I know you're coming back to the house. And I want to know how close you are to the house. So when you do come up the driveway, I greet you as soon as you come outside. You ever notice that when you, when you come up the driveway, I'm always outside? The Not only, always, but the, it's happened more frequently. It's because I'm checking you. <laughs> <laughs> I notice where you are. Or is it you're trying to get somebody out of the house before I get home? Well, the funny thing <laughs> you say that is because if they were going out the house, they would go right towards your car <laughs> so you would see them. So I don't know how that'd be very That's well. That's so funny. Well, if I sneak at the back door and they go down the back hill <laughs> so the neighbor's heart. Tuck and roll. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. yeah. Or, or up the cliff the other side, yeah. You're too much. Well, I wanted to ask at least because, you know, If I'm working from home a little bit more, I didn't know if it's an inconvenience because I don't have like a dedicated office space inside of the house, but we do have this beautiful studio, but then it does make it like, okay, well, if I was to relocate everything out there and get it all set up, what happens then when I have to have a week where I'm doing flower production? I can't obviously have all of my electrical stuff around the flowers and the water and the dirt and all of that. So you're right. I think it's better that I keep my workspace upstairs and I keep the separation with the business out in the backyard. Well, I just thought of this too, is that, you know, I have that portable monitor that plugs into all my stuff, you know, um, maybe you get one or two of those and you can have those like just for situations where you are setting shop up in the, you know, back in a studio, you can still have the production going on because I, one thing that's kind of cool is that if you do not have a multiple monitor set up now for your workstation, it's, um, I didn't think I would even enjoy it until I saw it in, in action. And I was like, wow. Well, until you, I exposed you to it. You, so Christine, Christine is, she actually is the gateway to all this stuff <laughs> because I, I was never set on getting a laptop. I was never set on getting a Mac. I was never set on any of the stuff until Christine showed me the, showed me the light. Showed you the light. You know, I was thinking about that as we were coming up to Christmas and the kids were all home. And I was thinking, you know, if I had the world my way, I would send you away for a week. Like if I had unlimited funds, I'd send you away for a week and I would completely renovate this room in here so that I would get rid of don't die right now. Okay. For all of you listening, We podcast in our downstairs studio space, which also uh, doubles as the bedroom for our oldest when he's home from college and when he's here with us. Guest bedroom, things like that. So, uh, but one whole wall in this room is Chris's podcast mess. (laughs) Excuse me. (laughs) It it is literally a podcast mess. It It is. It is. It is my office desk, which I had purchased for my old house. When I moved in there, I bought this ginormous, ginormous. like it's like shelving and it's got a like, hutch on top of it. Uh, it's like, it was, it was probably was designed in a time before like newer computers were invented because it had this big old like container section where your big old tower PC would go. In fact, the PC still sits in this thing. It's still lives in there as in today. And I would use it for all that stuff because I moved to the Wait, house. The tower is still in there. Yeah, it's in there right now. What? The tower PC that we started this podcast on. We don't still, even use it. Well, I don't also put it, so it still sits in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's still it's this little cave, all right. It still lives in there. And the thing is, is that um, when I you know this thing took me like literally like a week to put together, and asked my dad to help me out put this thing together. It was extremely heavy. And I put it in the old house because the old house had an incredible, nice little nook area within the master bedroom. It was perfect for a desk, for an office within the master bedroom. And that's where we did the original podcast, started from that. And when we moved into this house, 
The mover said they could move it and they eventually did move okay. it. So we moved before it over you here. Say, before you say the mover said they could move it, we got into an epic fight about this desk because it is so heavy and large. And I told you it was going to take up so much space and all it does is store like 90% clutter. As he stops. Uh, <laughs> to look back behind me and see and what you're talking about. accurate. Accurate, accurate. And I got more shelves and everything on the thing. I know you made more shelves to be able to add more space for more clutter. And well, it's better than being on the floor, baby. It is, it is. But if you look in every drawer or whatever, it's clutter. It is a clutter monster. <laughs> clutter but collection. It really is. But I was thinking, like, man, we could go to IKEA and like use I the IKEA storage solutions and make this like a super functional really cool podcasting space that also could repurpose for when we have guests in the room and not be so like in everybody's face. But you're not there yet emotionally. Uh, You know, this actually, like I said, it was the first computer desk thing I bought from when I moved out because when I moved out, when I moved away from the apartments I had and the other places I had, I had a really crappy, extremely crappy, hand-me-down computer desk. And that broke. Then I bought another one or I got one and I eventually threw that away because that broke. I think that was a hand-me-down too. Got from dumpster diving or something. I don't know where we got the thing from. But it was like, that's like this kind of desk I had. Right. So this desk was the first new actual real desk that I purchased myself in a store, brand new, put it together. And um, although... I did put one piece together backwards, as you can kind of tell. I can see it's a shelf, and you can see the particle board. It's like not to, it's supposed <laughs> to the back side, but it's on the front side. <laughs> but the thing was, this was step like three out of step five hundred. So I'm like, I am not changing it. It's it's gonna stay here the way it is. Okay, I have to tell you a story. This is a, a BC story. Is that okay? Yeah. What, Chris- what you got? Well, yeah. Okay. So in my previous life, you know, before Chris, in my previous relationship. My former father-in-law was putting together this same desk. And I think... Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I think that's Get what... Get the hell out of here. Was I, it the same color? Uh, or they, I think it, it was a dark wood. They had dark wood and this wood. Why I wanted, did you well, just flip me off? I'm sorry. They had, dark, they had dark wood and this one. I wanted the lighter one because no, they kind of matched the flooring. It was the dark wood one. And I remember because he was putting it together and having the hardest time. Oh, me too. And um, Ezekiel's father was helping him and he got frustrated like you do. No way. Because he was putting the the same piece on backwards. No way. (laughs) So I was there at their house and I went in to my former father-in-law. His name is Tim. And I was like, Tim, do you want my help? And Ezekiel's father was like, fine. And so I went in and I was like, oh, I know what the problem is. This piece is backwards. And then we reset that piece and everything was able to come together because I'm really good at putting things together, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I really, I read yes. directions very well. Yes. I'm just very careful about them. So it's really funny because every time I look at this desk, it reminds me because I look at that piece backwards and I think, you're not the only one that put that in backwards. So did Zeke's dad, but I fixed it before they finalized everything. It's kind of a funny story. Yeah, well, I actually like it the way it is, all right? <laughs> I think it has character, but... It does add character to the desk. But, you know, it's been um, an interesting Christmas week. We had uh, the boys, the littles with us, and we had a really nice holiday weekend. You actually were off Christmas Eve and Christmas Day which has not happened our entire relationship. And um, we took the boys for Christmas Eve dinner. We asked them where they wanted to go. And little Mason, you didn't know this, but he's asked me like seven times to take him to have lobster. Wait, aren't you allergic to fish? I am. He's not. But he keeps asking me. And he's kept begging to want to go to Red Lobster because in his mind, it's like a very fancy place to go for dinner. Bougie. Well, it can be, you yeah. know, because you order things that say market price on the <laughs> you know, item there. So for Christmas Eve dinner, we took the kids. The It was the four of us. We did not have Ezekiel with us this year for actual Christmas. We, If you listened to our last episode, we did Christmas a week early with him. Uh, but we took the littles to, we went to a movie. We went and saw the new Wonka movie, which is so great. And then uh, we took them on Christmas Eve night to Red Lobster. 
And Mason got to fulfill his dream of having lobster for the first time. And then at the end of dinner, he says, I like lobster because I have expensive taste. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. I know. We told him, well, you better make sure that you think about what kind of a job you want to have in the future to expo- to afford that expensive taste. And what did he say? He said, I already know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm going to oh, be yeah? a famous YouTuber. Oh, of, of course. Every kid, YouTube, my gosh. I know. But YouTube. he actually has a channel. He's almost got 500 subscribers and he's got a plan. I don't, I don't know how that's even possible. But, but it's his dream. Yeah, he's having fun doing. He likes doing that kind of stuff, being a content creator and trying to get in there. And he's playing his Roblox, Roblox or Roblox. What do you, how do you pronounce it? Roblox? Roblox. Okay. Yeah, well, Roblox. Whatever. And he uses Robux for his Roblox. That's what it is. I yeah. don't even know. It's a tongue twister, whatever yeah. what it is. So. But, but, you know, it's so, so funny because as we were sitting and talking with our kids at Christmas dinner, we were talking about, you know, getting excited for them uh, going into high school because Jacob's going into high school next year. And talking about what we try to do when we're talking with the kids is not about pressuring them for what they want to be when they grow up, but asking them what a, what kind of experiences they want to have in life. And then we talk about what it's going to take to get there. And so we were talking with Jacob about what experiences is he most excited to have in high school. And he was talking about sports and things like that. And it really made me think about my own high school and college experience and how I think Sometimes there's so much pressure that we put on ourselves or society puts on us to become something that we forget uh, the why of why we're pursuing a specific career. And that's why I think it's really important that we talk about finding joy in life and finding fulfillment in what we do. And that's why I think this week's guest for our podcast episode is so fantastic because we're going to be talking about life, careers the intersection between all of that and really just how to live your best life in the most fulfilled way possible, right? Absolutely. And Anthony will be on the show right Right after after this. this. Enjoy listening to podcasts and ever wonder, can I make a podcast? But it seems so complicated and good audio production can take time. What if there was a way to create an amazing podcast easily? Well, now there is. Introducing Podcasting Made Easy from Podtastic Audio. My production team will handle your entire audio production, allowing you to be the star of your show. This is Podcasting Made Easy. How easy? Well, so easy, you don't even have to press record. Now that's easy. Your listeners are waiting. Let's deliver. Sign up for a free strategy call today at podtasticaudio.com slash easy. And welcome back, everybody. Today, we have another fantastic VIP guest. I'm super excited to chat with him. He is a career satisfaction coach. Welcome to the show, Anthony Quo. Thank you. So good to be here and to talk to you. Hey, Anthony. Well, thank you for joining us today. Speaking of that, well, hey, where are you joining us from? I live in New York City. Wow, we were just there, New York City. That's amazing. Chris is actually sitting across from you wearing his Brooklyn t-shirt right now. I picked so up at the gift shop <laughs> He there. did that in honor of you. <laughs> I did. Well, actually, truth be told, as we record this, it's actually 9-11. So oh, yeah. that is why I wore the Brooklyn uh, t-shirt. And it's also why I was working on our YouTube video for New York, which is coming out soon. So, Yeah, that was... Ooh, that. That was a day for sure. I remember exactly where I was. Do you remember where you were when you found out? Absolutely. Yeah, I I did too. But let's hear your story. Were you actually in New York when it happened? Uh, I wasn't. I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey. Well, I I was born and raised in Queens. And then at like seven years old, my family moved over to New Jersey. So I'm like a half Jersey boy, half New Yorker. Uh, whichever side will have me. And I remember it, I was in gym class and uh, in the locker room changing. And the coach's office had a TV on and the news was on and they had footage of the towers burning. And, you know, we were like, what's going on? And I remember just having a chill run through my body and nobody would answer any questions because I was in middle school. What do you what do you say to a bunch of kids? And they just said someone flew a plane into the tower. And I asked, was it a, was it an accident? And 
just silence. No, nobody knew what to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, such a devastating day for our entire country, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it was. And and I always, um, I try to, I try to, you know, post about you know nine eleven and you know never forget and all that stuff every nine eleven like I did all morning long. So. Uh, I know they're having a memorials. I think they have one today or they had one today down there. Um, uh-huh. So are you actually in the city of New York? Are you in Manhattan? Yeah, I live in Manhattan. I'm on the Upper West Side, uh, just a block away from Central Park, which is pretty great because I have a dog to walk. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love Central Park. Well, so, okay, we have a fun story. So Chris had never been like in Central Park. He'd been kind of like around it when he was younger. So when we were just there a few weeks ago, uh, we decided to take a pedicab through Central Park to be able to go to the different places. But do you have a favorite spot in Central Park where you like to walk your dog? Uh, yes, we have a walking route that's uh, just around the uh, reservoir path. It's got some really nice uh, scenery. You got a great cityscape when the when the reservoir opens up and there's just you can see the entire Upper West Side. Um but my favorite path is actually not on our, uh, my favorite spot rather is not actually on our dog walk. It's a spot deeper in the park in a section called the Ramble where the, the trees are denser. It's where all the bird watchers go because it's, it's just a little bit more wild there. Right. I think I've and seen that. that is, yeah. Yeah. And that's actually where I proposed to my wife. What? Oh, tell yep. us the story. I need to know. I love all the, <laughs> I love sappy love stories. Oh, yeah. So it was a freezing day. I had this whole grand plan to propose to her like a few days ago when it was snowy and all romantic and the timing just didn't work out. And so I was determined. I had this ring burning a hole in my (laughs) sock drawer for like two weeks at this point. You made a whole Um, two weeks, huh, buddy? (laughs) (laughs) And, And I just was like, today is the day. We have to go. And so I woke her up and was like, We're, let's go for a walk. And she did not understand why I wanted to be so gung-ho about going to the park on a like 15-degree day. I was like, layer up. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's like a little bit cranky, dragging herself through the park with me. And I'm starting to like put on the lovey-dovey, like, you know, you mean so much to me. I love you so much. And she's not having it. (laughs) (laughs) And finally, she like, you know, after three or four attempts of this, like never say that I wasn't persistent. (laughs) (laughs) After three or four tries of this, she says to me, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd think you had a ring and you were trying to propose to me. (gasps) Oh, oh. (laughs) And I was like, you know what? Actually, I do. And I got down on my knee and pulled out the ring, turned that frown right upside down. Oh. What a hero. <laughs> Did anybody get on film? Did anybody, uh, any sneak photography? There was, uh, there was somebody watching from like 20, 30 yards away. They saw the whole thing and uh, she took pictures for us afterwards. That's wow. so sweet. I love that story. It's always when we're in our crankiest moods that things like that happen. It's just like... Gosh, man, couldn't you have just given me a little bit of a heads up? But, you know, the element of surprise is always great. Well, we had gone shopping for a ring together. So, like, she knew it was coming. Okay, uh, okay. But the proposal itself, I wanted it to be a surprise. That's so. amazing. So what is Central Park like when it's not green? I've only seen it when it's green and lush. When it's, like, cold and snow, is it, are you allowed to go out there? How does it work? Oh, yeah, you're allowed to go pretty much whenever. It's winter. (laughs) Right. So is it less crowded, I'm guessing? It's less crowded, especially on the colder days. Um, I will say my favorite, though, is when it snows here. There's just this, like, hush that comes over the city. There is so much noise that happens in, you know, just being in the big city. But when it snows, it's quiet. And you can hear yourself think. You can hear the crunch of the snow under your feet. And uh, if you go early before all the kids come out on the sleighs and uh, everyone tramples the snow and makes it all gross, (laughs) you feel like you're alone. That sounds so magical. And it's like a scene from a movie where you just like wake up in a 
like snow covered blanket of a city. And it just sounds very magical. I was there just one time during a, well, during and right after a massive snowstorm in New York. And it was like the whole city shut down because it was so much snow and it really was so beautiful until like the next day when, like you said, <laughs> all of the the snow gets dirty, but arriving in Central Park, because that day I went to Tavern on the Green and Central Park was just blanketed with snow and it was so magical where the, the snow is on the trees and it's just like something literally out of like a Hallmark movie for sure. It really is a, a winter wonderland when it snows here. You guys get all the seasons over there. You get the, it's super hot during the summer and you get snow mm-hmm. during the winter. Check yeah. you out. And the changing of the leaves <laughs> for sure. Oh yeah. So Anthony, what made you move to Manhattan? Was it career? Was it school? It was my wife. Oh, See, I was going to guess that I, yeah. one. I would say a it woman. Love. It's always a woman, you know. It was love. It was love. I mean, so I went to NYU. Uh, so I, the, the draw of the city was already there. I went to the uh, NYU school, uh, Stern School of Business, and thought that I was going to get a job in the city. And technically I did, but the company that I got a job at happened to place me in their New Jersey office because that's where the department I was in was based. And that place just so happened to be 10 minutes away from my parents' house. So you know, fresh out of college, the appeal of not paying rent was too strong. <laughs> yeah, I uh, bet. Yeah, so I, I was, I reverse commuted into the city three, four times a week to date my girlfriend at the time. And it was commitment, <laughs> but it paid <laughs> off. That's so awesome. how, how do you travel there from New Jersey to Manhattan? Is there a tunnel or is it a bridge? Uh, there's both. Okay. And you just drive, yeah. What do you prefer? You could take the train also. I mean, I I like the bridge just because uh, I get claustrophobic yeah. with the tunnel. But <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> um, but the the tunnel actually was what was closest to where my girlfriend lived. Feels weird calling her my girlfriend, but that's where <laughs> she does, was at the time. It? I know. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to be chronologically accurate here. Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, how long have you two lovebirds been married now? Five years. We're actually coming right up on the uh, on the anniversary. Well, congratulations! Congratulations! Wow! Thank and, you! Thank you! And so we've wondered. Chris and I you know, had our little New York adventure just a couple of weeks ago, and we're always very fascinated. We live in San Diego, which is a much more uh, geographically spread out region. Uh, I mean, we definitely have a downtown area, but not even a fraction near as dense as New York. But what is it like to live in a city that has so many people? Like we see there's all these restaurants, there's, you know, we see it's traffic and parking is hard, but what is it like a day-to-day life in living in the city? <laughs> you know, I I have this conversation with some of my friends who come from smaller cities and I have the exact same question. What's it like to live around not that many people? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, for me. It feels normal, but like you, you named it right. Like there's there's restaurants literally down the street. I can walk through the city and have an amazing meal or see an amazing show. And I don't know. It's it's weird because New York City is such a densely populated city. There's people everywhere. Like so, you might think that you wouldn't you wouldn't feel alone, but it actually can also feel really lonely because there's so many people. You just sort of like dissolve into the masses. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, and, well, and, and people like, you don't know either. They're all strangers to you. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're like an Island in a sea of strangers or it can feel that way. And you know, it, it's got its pros and cons for sure. So do you have a vehicle? I want to know a car. We do, and we pay an arm and arm and a leg to keep it in a garage. Okay, okay. I was kind of wondering how that works because I, and uh, do you use it or it's only for like a weekend kind of toy? It's more of a weekend thing. I, I used yeah. to reverse commute to Jersey for my job, and that was a drag. Let me tell you. 
Yeah, well, we, we took many of taxis and many of Ubers and many of <laughs> modes of transportation running around the city. So uh, I, I was kind of wondering what that's like. I knew that some parking garages, depending on where you park at, can cost as much as an apartment rent somewhere else can. Yep. Um, yep. And, and that kind of thing. And I get it because there's not a lot of space. I mean, it's space is a premium. I know apartments are probably pretty small for top dollar. I was watching, mm-hmm. so I watched something on, I, I love these Instagram reels and these accounts where it's like Manhattan listings. And I follow this one where they're showing the world's like Manhattan smallest apartment. Oh yeah. And it was like literally, I think I could touch it, stretch his arms out and touch it from side to side. <laughs> yeah. And it had like a little loft to sleep in and a tiny little fridge. I think he even had a shared bathroom down the hall. <laughs> it's crazy. You know? Oh my God. Yeah. And what do they want? Like $2,000 a month for it? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds all right. Yeah. That's the nerves. <laughs> That's insane. Well, so now you live in the city and you talked about you used to reverse commute out to your job. So do mm-hmm. you work for, do you have a full-time job or is your full-time job in your career satisfaction coaching? I am a full-time career satisfaction coach and I've been doing that for five years now. That's full-time. amazing. So Chris and I were having this little conversation right before the interview and like, what is the difference between a traditional career coach versus a career satisfaction coach? Hmm. A career coach. Well, first of all, there are many styles of being a career coach. Um, And it depends on what your, what part of the career development and career process matters to you. Typical career coaching, I think, is around the job acquisition phase, right? Where it's like, how do you do your resume? What's your interview strategy? How do you network? All really important and valuable stuff to focus on. You know, and, and that's where I started, but it's a pretty advanced question to be asking if you think about it, Mm -hmm. because it kind of is predicated on knowing what you want to do, (laughs) right? Or knowing what problem you want to solve. And that's where I think the more upstream questions that I help answer come into play. I like to affectionately say that I help people figure out what they want to do when they grow up. Yeah. What if I want to be an astronaut or, (laughs) or or a firefighter or I want to be an astronaut firefighter, you know? How do you you answer those questions, you know? (laughs) Well, yeah, it's it's about being yourself at work. I mean, who hasn't felt like themselves at work at some point in their lives, right? They, or, or, you know, have you ever felt like you had to put on a mask and make it through your day and grit your teeth? Wait, right? that's not normal? Well, that's, that's what you should do right here. That's, that's, a, that's a role, a role in life. Yeah. <laughs> So you're you're well, what if, so you're pretty upset. So you're at work and you're just kind of like grinning and bearing it, but you really deep down inside don't feel like you belong here. Almost as if you're like in New York City and you feel like you're in the sea of strangers that you don't. You feel like you're alone. Yeah, exactly. I had I actually did have that experience while I was in the corporate world. I was I was successful. I had the six figure salary and I had respect. And there was something nagging, even though it was going really well, it felt like I didn't belong. Mm. And it like, it ate at me. It really did. I would come home and uh, my friend has the best word for it. She calls it dish rag syndrome. I, I came home and I, all I could do was flop over like a dish rag. I so that sounds fun. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know there was any other way of being. <laughs> I'm laughing because this is like so awkward because it's literally what I just did when I walked in the door right now. And Chris is like, what is oh, going no. on with you? And I'm like, Ugh. yeah, welcome to Disrag Christine. <laughs> yeah, and, the then, show. and then we were getting ready for the interview and I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be a good one, especially today. <laughs> Oh boy. Oh so, boy. So distract syndrome, this concept of just like not not having satisfaction and then just coming home and feeling so drained. There's so many people I think that experience that. And is that all because we end up getting stuck into something that 
we think is the quote unquote right job to do or the safe choice instead of pursuing what really fills us with passion? That's certainly one reason for it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just straight up burnout and you're in an abusive, toxic, overworking, underappreciating environment. Or it could be that you're not doing something that feeds you. Mm -hmm. Um, And you bring up such a good point about the expectations that others have. I, you know, speaking from my own personal experience, when I went into the corporate world and started working on my career, I was trying to be the best son I possibly could. And for my family and for me, that meant getting good grades from a good school, getting a good job with a good salary. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm Chinese American. My parents immigrated to this country. And for me to be able to succeed at doing that, that was like the family's achieved the American dream. It's what my parents came here for, or so I thought, right? Mm -hmm. And I checked all those boxes. I had the job. I had the car. I had the house. And it just wasn't doing it. And it was so confusing to me because I didn't understand why I had everything that I worked so hard for and yet felt so empty inside. That's interesting. Do you know how not alone I am in that? It's actually extremely common. I was going to say that. Yeah, it sounds sounds common. How many people do you think actually enjoy their job? Well, I have hard numbers for you. Uh, There was a Gallup survey. They do the survey every year, and every year the numbers are terrible, but the last last year's numbers were especially so. Uh, 60% of U.S. workers report that they are disengaged with their jobs. 50% say they're stressed. And 19% say they're miserable at their job. I mean, people actually do enjoy their jobs. I mean, that that does mean that 40% of people are engaged, right? <laughs> right. Of those 40 people, 40%, do you think they're like new hires maybe? They just got a job and they're excited because no, it's a new actually, thing? No, uh, actually, I mean, that that might be part of it. I think that it is a matter of finding an environment and a context where you can be yourself when you're the best, like when you're the best version of yourself. I am happy to say that I have really great job job satisfaction right now. Good for <laughs> you. I've, Look at you, you know, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, I, and I've worked really hard to create that. Like it didn't start out that way. Running a business, as I'm sure you can attest, is mm-hmm. hard. Starting yep. a business is really hard. It puts a strain on your time, your energy, your family, your finances. And I like to say that career satisfaction is not any single point in time. It's not like you make a decision and leave your job and there you have it. That's career satisfaction. It's not, I landed in this new dream job and there you have it. I have career satisfaction. Career satisfaction is a consistent choice that you make over and over and over again. It's paying attention to yourself and noticing what's working for you and what's not, and then using that information to do something about it. So building off of that, Anthony, you know, I was just thinking about how, you know, some people, they go into specific line of work because they just got to pay the bills. Yeah. Or, you know, I think it's like most people. Or it's like what's expected of them. But There's people that are like me that get to this point in their career where they've been fairly successful and they're getting a a nice paycheck and then they look around and it's like, well, I could do X, Y, and Z, which might make me happier, but at what cost? I was literally just having this conversation with a friend a couple of weeks ago over dinner uh, who left are the industry that we work in and is now running their own business. And we were having this conversation around like, I'm not trapped because I do have power. Like I can choose to take a different job, but I would be also choosing to sacrifice a certain level of comfort for my family. And so at some point it starts to feel like it's almost like 
I refer to them as golden handcuffs. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like I am so successful, and yet at the end of the day, well, I'm successful financially by you know the world standards of success, which is like the monetary success. But am I fulfilled in my soul, or am I feeling like? my job is an energy vampire. And so how do you help people that are in that dynamic of feeling kind of tethered just because of the financial stability aspect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's such a important and also really common situation that people are in because reality is we have to pay the bills. We have to keep a roof over our heads. We have to put food on the table, right? I want to say two things about this. One is that career satisfaction and developing career satisfaction doesn't necessarily mean leaving your job. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to change your career 180 degrees. I had this client who, when she started working with me, she was like, this close to just rage quitting and telling everyone at her job where to shove it. <laughs> you know, uh, she was absolutely miserable and so burnt out. Did you call and, it rage quitting? Yeah. Oh, I love that term. Okay. Keep going. I'm, I'm enthralled. <laughs> yeah. She was so close to just rage quitting and, you know, in, in kind of an irresponsible way. Right. But like, that's what, she, that's what the rage drives you to do. <laughs> and when I worked with her, she was able to completely transform her job from the inside out. It started with her taking a vacation and not letting the team email her. And with one conversation at a time, with one boundary set at a time, with one assertion of her needs at a time, a few months later, she showed up to one of our sessions and was like, Anthony, I'm doing great. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually doing really freaking great. And I feel like I have completely changed my job without having to change my job. Was it just mostly perspective and boundary setting or did people start to operate with her differently or is it mindset? It was both uh, and or all of the above. Uh, she definitely started setting more boundaries. She also started articulating what her needs were. Um, and part of what her needs were was to take on a set of responsibilities and activities that use the skills she actually wanted to use. So the second part of what I wanted to share uh, in response to your situation was that it's so common to land in a career where you are good at what you do, right? Because that's that's what the system reinforces. That's right. what happens when you have good grades. Your parents tell you, great job. Your teachers tell you, great job. When you do a good job at work, you get paid more, ideally, or at least somebody tells you you're doing a good mm -hmm. job. You get and a no pizza day in, in the office, but you give what they yeah. give you. <laughs> <laughs> pizza party. <laughs> right? And nowhere in there, typically... Is there a question about, yeah, but what do you need, right? It's all about what can you do for me? What can I do? What skills can I offer to get paid? But at some point, you know, the difference between satisfaction or not is being able to answer the question, what do I need in order to thrive? Because there's a really big difference between having a skill versus actually enjoying it. Okay, tell us more. I'm I'm sitting with that. Having a skill versus actually enjoying it. Yeah, so let's let's rewind to my childhood for this actually because I mentioned that my parents were immigrants to this country. They were also really really talented musicians. Oh, nice. Uh, Juilliard trained musicians. My mom's classical pianist, my dad played the trumpet. Wow. Uh and you might not be surprised to learn that I played the piano no, growing really? up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, my mom would, when she was pregnant with me, she would put headphones on her belly so that she could play Mozart to me. Wow. Does that work? Does that make you, make you motivated to want to play the, play the piano? 
Uh, funny story. I ended up hating the piano. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe right? it backfired. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's the thing, right? I was really good at it. I played at Carnegie Hall when I was 17. Wow. And, and that was the last concert I ever played because I was so done with it. I grit my teeth through it. I had something I wanted out of it, which was a recording of the concert that I could send to schools for scholarship applications. That was it for me. It wasn't about the art. It wasn't about the music. It wasn't even about making mom happy at that point. It was just, I'm going to get the thing I need and I'm going to get out. And hmm. so I did. Right. And so, so like what a dichotomy, what, what a like split screen difference of what's going on outside, which is I had a skill good enough to get me into Carnegie Hall. And on the inside, I just couldn't get far away enough. That's a really difficult situation to be in because especially when so many people could be so envious of that, that skill or their perception that it's a talent. And then for you to just set it aside, I'm sure that, your family, your friends were like, but what are you doing? Like, you're so good at it. And, you know, you could, you could do X, Y, and Z. And inside you're like, and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my mom certainly was like, oh, Anthony, what a waste of talent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's like, well, I'm talking the same thing. I don't want to go to clown school. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a challenging situation to be in. So then what did you do after that? I went to school for what I thought I wanted, which was business. I, you know, we, we asked that question, what do you want to do when you grow up? My answer was a businessman because I wanted to be cool like my dad and hold a briefcase. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Tur turned out I never needed a briefcase in my entire career. I just got one because I thought it was cool. Um, so dream accomplished. Thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> That's easy. Um, but, you know, my, my understanding and my desire for business was to go into business for myself. And eventually, spoiler alert, that did happen. But it took a really long time. And there were quite a few detours along the line. Because, again, for what was just pounded into my psyche, the path to success was through a, a good, secure job at a prestigious Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. so that's what they teach you, you know, from, yeah. from birth, for the most part. Exactly. It's, it's what popular culture reinforces, for sure. And so I did that. And the same cycle repeated itself. I was really good at it. I was using skills that was getting me respect, recognition, money. And on the inside, I was like, mm -mm, this is not it. Mm. And don't get me wrong. I didn't just sit there feeling miserable. I tried everything I could think of to make it better. I changed my jobs. I had, I, I did everything that my client did. Like I was setting boundaries. I was setting expectations. I was asking for things and I was getting it. And yet it was like this itch I couldn't scratch or I was scratching in the wrong spot. You ever, you ever get that feeling where... You know, if you've been coughing and wheezing a lot, I don't know about you. This is going to sound weird, but like, I feel like I get an itch under my armpit that I just can't reach from the outside. Do you ever feel that? <laughs> That's being around New York. I, I got the same thing when I was there. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's the uh, pollution here. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's, I get what you're saying. Like you just, it's this thing that you just can get close to, but you never can quite put your finger on it. It's kind of elusive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. After eight years of trying to change variables around or getting paid more or getting put on the right team, I realized that what I really needed was to work for myself, I, that there was no way to do that as an employee in corporate America. It didn't matter how much of a quote unquote entrepreneur I became, I had to go out and do it on my own. And is that just because you didn't believe that there was something out there for you in a company that could fulfill your needs so much so that you needed to create it yourself? Or is it just that you knew that no matter what, 
that would like working for somebody else wouldn't fulfill you? Both. I had just this burning desire to create something that I could call 100% my own. And I didn't see a way to do that in while being employed by somebody else. Got it. And I also learned uh, later, and, and this is part of the process that I teach, I learned that I had some really, really specific needs. I had some really specific styles and some really specific interests that I that are part of who I am as a person. They're just baked into my personality that I really, really wanted to meet. And the environment, the context just wasn't conducive to that in mm. the corporate world. That's very interesting. I mean, I, I get that, yeah. So as you have now come on to this side of it and you're now in this career satisfaction coaching field, what does it look like for you to come alongside someone that maybe is a bit less than fulfilled in their their career? Like what is, I guess, what does your coaching look like for them? <laughs> well, uh, Christine, would you be willing to play with me a little? Because you, hey, you wait, dropped wait, hey, a, hang on, a nice hang on, big hang on bomb now. earlier. Hang on now. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is like, what kind of games? <laughs> well, okay, so full transparency. We were talking just a bit before we started to record about, now, first of all, I'm very grateful that I have a good job and I've been in this line of work for 20 years. And so I say that from the get-go, but... I am at a point where I'm, it's not filling my bucket the way like it used to. And I have a lot of guilt around that because it's like you've, I've been conditioned to be, have so much gratitude that I have a paycheck, that I have stability, that I can provide for my family. And so there's like guilt and shame and all of that all wrapped up into it. And then still at the end of the day, I'm like, but do I deserve to come home feeling like this every day. And I mean, I don't have a, a cut and dry answer for that. I just am just, you know, kind of sitting in this space right now where I'm just kind of like feeling my way around all of that. So yes, all of that to say, my little monologue there, Anthony, I'm ready to hop in the sandbox. Let's go. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And and thank you for talking about this openly because that is something that I've noticed is really, really hard to do. People are, I think, rightfully hesitant to share that they're not happy at work. Like if you looked on LinkedIn, everyone's got a celebration post, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's got a celebration post. Nobody is talking about this. I and haven't actually, seen it's a, a quitting post yet. So, <laughs> that kind of thing? It's like people will like anonymously post those quiet quitting uh, articles like why in the world or, you know, like the, um, the whole, I think there was like one whole company that like quit over the weekend because they got rid of their remote working policy or something like that. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yes, let's talk about it. Yeah. But like it's, and, and it's so important that we are talking about it because I know that so many people are feeling exactly what you're feeling, but they don't feel like they have the license to even admit it. So thank you for giving everyone that permission. You're welcome. I'll be the guinea pig. <laughs> so, I mean, where, where I would start is I would just get really curious about what's happening now. And one of the things that really caught my attention when you shared a bit was that you've been doing this for a long time and you phrased it in a way that was like, hey, this has filled your cup. It has fulfilled you. And so I'm just really curious about, you know, what what was that and what's changed? Well, uh, Where's the couch? I'm like ready to go to the you therapist. You are on the couch now. right now. <laughs> so there's been some dynamics that, you know, have made things very difficult. And, you know, for legality purposes, I can't get into all of the the logistics of what's happened. But there's been some really messy, very dramatic, very political stuff that's occurred that I was um, required to be in the middle of that it was a situation that 
no employee wants to be in and I didn't have a way to get out of it. I had to go through it. And, you know, it was, it was excruciating last year. And I mean, there were days when Chris would come home and I'd just be, we have this little, like, it's kind of one of like those nest chairs. It's like a little hammock in the backyard. And I'd just be like literally curled up there almost like catatonic because it was just, you know, you can't cry that many tears. And so even after Mm. going through that and, you know, me continuing to stay on the side of right and seeing that the organization did ultimately make the move to stand by me through that process is still on the other side of it. There's wounds and they're deep because it's like, I'm still there. I'm still having to do the same job that I've done before and, but nobody talks about what happened. It's a big secret because nobody can talk about what happened. Just all of a sudden things were different and people are left questioning like why the changes were made. And I'm still having to show up for work while people are talking about, you know, all of the whispers like, oh, well, what happened? Da, 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 da. And, you know, new leadership is there. And I thought things would get better. And there's just this complete disappointment that it's not better. Oh, that sounds really painful. Oh, yeah. Like to say that's like putting it very lightly. And so, you know, I'm very thankful for Chris being by my side through that because there were days where I just was looking at him and I was like, you know, I we don't have the ability for me to just walk away when I'm the primary income earner. Like I can't just adios this joint without being like, okay, well, I'm going to quit and then we're going to lose the house. Like, you know, there's there's that that feeling of- The golden handcuffs. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's an especially hard place to feel when you don't necessarily have like a concrete picture of what you'd like next, right? Right. So, you know, I'm on LinkedIn and I see these different jobs that pop up and like today there was this position and I look at them and I'm like, I ask every time, could that be the thing that helps like fix this for me? But then it's like, well, it's just like you can't go looking for a relationship when you haven't done the work on yourself. Like you haven't gone through the therapy for yourself. I keep looking at these job postings and I'm like, well, what right do I have to go and pursue this other job when I think it's something deeper that I need to figure out how to resolve before I go and look for the next new shiny object? Mm-hmm. Well, that is, I feel you, that is tough. Did I stump you? Are we? No, no, <laughs> not at all. I'm, I'm just, I'm just feeling that with you. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I'm sorry that's been your experience. Um, well, what if we switch gears for a sec? Because the tempting thing to do here is to just ask, hey, so what do you want to do next? Right. But I know that is a really tough question to ask and answer. Right. Right. It's, it's so simple. It's so easy to ask, well, okay, well, if you don't want to do this, what would you do otherwise? But it's a really big question, isn't it? Right. Like huge, like world shakingly huge. Because the answer is I, I feel like I'm doing good with my job. Like I feel that what the result of what I do produces positive things for others. It's just, I don't like the yucky feeling that comes along with, and it's not even like the work in and of itself, but it's the the messy stuff. Like if I could just work by myself (laughs) and not have to talk to people, I mean, other than the people that I serve, like that would be, that would be cool with me. I could handle that. (laughs) Well, actually, uh, so, so I'm just going to like pause and thank you again for sharing that. You know, it's so interesting that you the thing that you said was so yucky was that like there were whispers and people weren't talking about it. And then here we are 
on a podcast talking about things. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing this podcast for a while. And uh, one of the things, one of the very first things that I do when I start working with people is just get really curious about what is it that makes you tick? What are the values that are important to you? What are What is your favorite way of showing up? And there are clues all around us, right? So I'm I'm just noticing, hey, maybe openness is really important. Maybe uh, maybe your podcast is one way that you are getting to express that. Maybe it's an outlet, right? And the thing that's frustrating you at work, maybe maybe you know that's that's an unfortunate mismatch in what's an important to you versus what's actually being experienced. Yeah. That's really accurate. Actually, I really do value like integrity, openness, and transparency. And when there's a lack of that at a leadership level or in the organization, I get very turned off because I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't thrive in that kind of environment. I don't thrive with backbiting, backstabbing drama of any kind, mean girl kind of stuff. Like not all about that. So yeah, like you hit the nail on the head. Openness is, it's very high up there. Well, it also sounds like you're deeply serving people in a, in, in a way that feels meaningful to you. Otherwise, if it were just that kind of environment and if everything was bad, we wouldn't be even having the conversation, right? It would just, you would have already been out of there. Right. So something, something is keeping you there, right? Absolutely. Well, the paycheck might be a big chunk of that. But it's not even that, Chris. I mean, if you think about it, I've been in this line of work for 20 years and it's, I feel, I do feel that it is a calling. I feel that it's deeper than just a career. I feel that it's a, a lifestyle decision to be able to go in to public service in this way. And it is like the the school districts that I work with and the leaders that I support and ultimately knowing that we're going to have a positive impact on children is what keeps me there and tethered to the work is this, I don't want to say moral obligation because it's not even an obligation. It's just this, this deep desire to leave this world better than. But you want help. Right. But better than the way that I, I found it. Yeah. So, I mean, right there is such, there's so much good information in what you're sharing, right? Like there's you, the interest that you have in making the world better, right? Helping people in a certain way, you know, you, you are, your style is open and transparent. And, you know, these, this is the type of information that I start collecting with people to, to just start developing something that I call the care card. Like, you know, when you buy a plant from the store, it's got a little tag on it. Like I've got this basil on my windowsill that's been struggling because it's been hot and, and I haven't watered it as much as I needed to, but you know, it's the, the care card tells you what you need to do to help that organism thrive. Right. Right. And I tend not to read them and I like overwater <laughs> but, mostly but you're succulents. you're a florist, babe. You're a florist. I, I deal with dead flowers. They're already cut, honey. So they're on their way out. But, <laughs> but yes, like, like I, me. I am the person that I will get that plant and I'll be like, oh, I don't need that. Or I read it and I'm like, Psh, I know how to take care of it better. <laughs> and that would be like exactly what's happening with my career is like, mm-hmm. maybe I haven't been tending to what I need in that environment or even figuring out how to get my needs met in the environment that I'm in. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So that's, you've pretty much done like taking the first step right there. Just recognizing that, Hey, you have needs and Hey, I might not have been meeting them or I might not be in an environment where I need to meet that. and what can I do about that? Right. So what can she do? (laughs) Well, um, that depends on what you would like. Uh, and also it depends on what, what the end goal is here. But I wonder if there are certain conversations that can be had that might be uncomfortable, 
or if that ship has sailed? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I think that there's fear and I don't know if that's pretty common, but I don't know what I'm afraid of. I don't know if it's a fear of being rejected or a fear of like asking to get my needs met and then finding out that maybe I'm not in important enough. I don't know. It's like, mm. not, yeah. I don't know if important enough is the right word, but. Well, we always feel like we always can be uh, replaced at work, yes. you know, and that's probably why a lot of people try to, I guess, over, I don't know, they try to, you know, over accomplish too much stuff to show that like, hey, I can do all this stuff and then some, so you better keep me around. You know, it come uh, if there's a time when you make cuts, you know, and everyone's kind of thinking of that too in the back of their heads. Like if they're going to, you know, downsize the company. I don't want to be on the choppy block. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 And I mean, these, these are serious considerations, right? Like it's really important to understand this for yourself. Like what makes it difficult to rock the boat? And actually some really valuable information is being surfaced right there, right? Like what might you lose that you value if you rock the boat? You know, um, your, your, okay. your paycheck, your stability, maybe your sense of self if you get rejected. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot, there's a lot mm-hmm. on the line uh, for anybody really. I mean, especially if you, if you come to a point in your life where you have house, car, career, family, it's you know, all those things are relying on your paycheck. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, there's a, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to just, I mean, we're not like a 19 year old kid working at McDonald's where we can say, screw <laughs> right, you right. boss, I'm out of here, you know, <laughs> or whatever. It's a little right. more risk. Right. Now there is a really, there's some good news here. Uh, I promise is that typically when somebody's gotten to this phase in their lives and their careers, they also have a lot to offer and they, right. Like the 19 year old kid who might be into their like very first job they haven't had a lot of experience. They might be able to offer a ton of value, but it's a little bit of a harder sell. And even if they have experience, they're pretty green, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Christine, you've been working in this field for 20 years. You've seen a lot. You've, right? Right. (laughs) You've been around the block. You know your stuff. And I imagine also if you stayed around for that long, you're pretty dang good at what you do. I would have to say yes, I am. <laughs> I, I, I say yes too. I I'll see yes. my horn. Yeah, I would say that I am in the area that I'm in. I'm an expert in my field, and I can say that without feeling cocky or conceited. Like I've had to, I've had to come a long way to be able to say that about myself without like being afraid that people were going to think that I'm full of myself. But I, I am really good at what I do. I am. I'm I'm so glad to hear you say that. <laughs> and so that's the other side to lean into. Like, what are you good at? What what about that do you enjoy? And I, I am willing to bet large amounts of money that there are parts of what you do that you are good at that you do enjoy. This is true. Yes. Awesome. I don't have to give up the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then it's about like, shaping up the narrative, right? Like, you know, you ask, what can I do about this? It's now here's where that, that what can I do for you starts to become important, but where it starts to take on a different feel from if you had just gone off to write your resume without having this conversation, you would just say, I do this. I solve these problems. I make these people happy. Right. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, the type of environment that's important to you, the type of culture that's important to you. And maybe now you might put on your resume something like, I foster open and transparent environments with integrity, just to broadcast that value a little bit because you know it's important to you, right? Right. And then that says to the universe or, you know, whomever is reading my resume, like, if you have this... I will fit well within your environment. Like you're not going to, you're not going to find me being a backbitey kind of dramatic person. I'm a, I'm a worker bee. Like that's literally, I have taken great pride in the quality and the volume of work that I do. Like you want me, I tell my friends at work, I'm like, you want me 
in your group work team. Like I'm that kid in college where when they're dividing up and making you do work, uh, group work, people are like, Christine, you want to be part of our group? And I'm like, uh, or you say, hey, sure. Hey, Christine, I, uh, what are the answers? what's the answer for, for question 25? Nope, see, I have integrity. I'm not going to give them that. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's like finding the teams that you want to be on because they share your values. Absolutely. So... Now, Anthony, do you work with people from all different levels of their career Mm -hmm. and all different types of industries, or do you have one specific specialty? The specialty is in creating the experience of satisfaction. So I work with people who are 20-something and in their first job out of school all the way to approaching retirement, executives, middle managers, uh, you know, some teachers, some artists, some people in tech. So it runs the gamut. And it's really fascinating that the universal principles hold. So no matter which career you're dealing dealing with, uh, people come to you ideally with the same situation. They're not satisfied with whatever it is they do. So the same things you tell them pretty much can be put in place no matter what the job is you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the specifics will look different. Obviously, right? right? Yeah. Like, you, you're not a, you're not a bunch of nineteen year olds here, right? <laughs> right? Well, Different life circumstances. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, everyone's got a kid in them. I hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's about taking the 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 process and then adapting it to your life. I always say that your career should work for your life, not the other way around. And so, thus, the the process also works for your life and not the other way around. Absolutely. And then how do your, your clients normally find you? Is it through LinkedIn or word of mouth or do you have like a website? I do have a website um, and I do have a pretty strong uh, word of mouth pipeline because um, everybody knows somebody who hates their job. Right? <laughs> yeah, you, um, can, you can't throw a rock far enough let me tell you hit someone. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, you know, somebody... I can't go to a party and say what I do without somebody being like, oh my God, help me. Or, oh my God, you need to talk to so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, therapists make up a pretty strong component of my referral Yeah, I would base. think so. Yeah, I would think so. so. I would think people go to therapy for, um, with, no, I guess going to therapy, would it be mainly because you hate your job? Is it like a main main uh, component to reason why you would go to therapy? Well, there's definitely a interaction, right? If you're super miserable at your job, you're going to have some depression and anxiety, most likely. And then therapists talk to people about everything, about what's going on in their lives. And so they see the misery people are facing at their jobs, but they're not trained. They're trained in mental health. They're not trained in writing a resume, (laughs) right? Right. And it would seem that if somebody is struggling in their career, that it would have some type of tangible impact on their mental health as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, when I was dish ragging around my apartment, I was so depressed. I, uh, and I didn't have the language to describe it. It took my wife badgering me to go into, th- into therapy for myself, for me to put words around that. But that was what was happening. My, my mental health was not doing great. My social life was not doing great. Yeah. It, there is. So like I said, uh, there's a real interplay between mental health and career satisfaction. Yeah, it it, definitely. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Well, so Anthony, we've had a lot of fun chatting with you today and getting deep here, but for our listeners that are tuning in, if they've been listening to you know, what you've said and some of it is hitting home with them, what resources or services can you connect them to so that they can take advantage of your expertise? Well, uh, first of all, my website is untamedcareer.com. So if anything is resonating and you're like, hmm, maybe that sounds like something I might be interested in, uh, you can learn about career satisfaction coaching there. Um, And on the website, uh, there's a quiz that I'm very excited about uh, because it's uh, pretty fresh off the presses. My team and I have been working hard at developing it. It's called 
is your career building or breaking your mental well-being? And, you know, because because it can be so hard to tell sometimes when it's just your day to day, like you clock in, you grind, you come home, you flop and just repeat and rinse. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need a wake up call. Sometimes you just need a little like, hmm, how am I actually doing? And if that resonates, then that is there. And nice. it'll give you a career health score and some practical tips based on okay. what's happening. Okay. So the career health score, is it from like one to 10 or is it a grade like A, B, C, D, E, uh, A, B, C, F? But, uh, but is it, how do you grade it? Yeah. So it's, it starts off at like, you're burning out, you know, like I think things are looking pretty rough <laughs> and you know, if, if, if you're honest about how you answer, of course. Um, and then it goes to, well, some things are working, some things are not. And then it goes up to, uh, you know, things are pretty good. And maybe I wonder what, what more there is for you. And then the, the uh, highest score is um, things are pretty great. You're in your, in your dream job. You're in an environment where you feel appreciated. Everything's great. Well, that's uh, the goal for everybody, I would think. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's funny that as you're saying this, I'm thinking, so if I was to take the quiz, would I answer for my life as a whole or would I answer for my day job or would I answer for my side business? Because I think that those would (laughs) result in two very different results. Uh, But, you know, it would also have helped me understand a little bit more of, where I'm at in my life and where I'm spending all of my energy as well. You know, that is a really interesting question. I would love for you to take the quiz from like each of those perspectives and tell me what you get. Oh, absolutely. Oh, nice, I nice, will totally yeah. do that. I love taking quizzes. <laughs> I like grew up on Seventeen Magazine and you know, all oh. of the like, are you a summer or are you a fall? Like all of those types of things. So <laughs> I I love taking quizzes. I'll definitely I do am that. 100% inspired by like BuzzFeed, which <laughs> Harry Potter house are you from kind of quizzes. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Anthony, we really do appreciate you taking time. Uh, We know you've joined us very late your hour on East Coast time after what I'm sure has been a full day for you. Uh, But what words of wisdom would you like to leave our listeners with before we wrap it up for today? Listen to your dissatisfaction. It is trying to tell you something. So don't like brush it under the rug. Don't uh, paper over it with, feeling grateful for what you do have. Obviously that is important, but the dissatisfaction is there. It's your body. It's your mind giving you a signal. So the least you could do is listen, right? Absolutely. And with that, Anthony, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Anthony. Listeners, we're going to put all of the, the links in the show notes and make sure you hop on over to Anthony's website, untamedcareer.com to take that quiz And definitely reach out to Anthony Quo if you have any questions about how you can be more satisfied with your job or find the right fit for you. And so, Anthony, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. Are you in the middle of wedding planning and feeling overwhelmed? There's no need to fret, my friend. Christine Smith Designs is here to rescue you. Offering wedding planning, coordination, and wedding floral design services, let us help relieve your stress and make your wedding day dreams a reality. Visit us at christinesmithdesigns.com. That's K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E smithdesigns.com and request a free consultation. You'll be so glad you did. Well, Anthony was so great. I really appreciated the opportunity to chat with him about his expertise. And you know, he has such a unique story of you know being in music and having that pressure and then you know moving into this area of uh I wouldn't call it life coaching, but career coaching. Yeah. And also being li- that he lives in New York City, we're going to go to New York City for uh, we surprise our kids with New York City Christmas present to head over there next summer. I know. Maybe we should meet up with Anthony. Maybe he'll tell us the absolute best place to go for pizza. You know what? I want to know for sure. Like, it, Anthony, if you're listening, hey, want to meet up? Well, you know, we can, you know, we'll, we'll go. We to should. Pe- well, let's go have pizza. You know what would be so fun is if anybody that we've ever done podcasting with, 
if we did like a podcast meetup in New York for all of our like East Coast guests. And speaking of that, we do have a very good friend in the podcasting community that him and his wife live in Brooklyn and we're really looking forward to seeing them. Yeah, we were out there last time we visited last time we were out there um, during during the summer. And um, yeah, I think it's great going to New York City, you know, get a lay of the land, figure where things are at, you know, get to see all the all the architecture and, and all the different historical buildings that are there and Central Park and all the great wonderful pizza I like to eat. You know, right. I, I love pizza and New York is like the best. So. Absolutely. And, you know, John, who runs the Basement Surge podcast, is our friend that lives out in Brooklyn. So shout out to John. And I don't know, uh, John, you're going to have to listen to this episode now because I forgot to say this and I was supposed to email you. But our oldest son, Ezekiel, it thinks so highly of your podcast and would love to be a guest on your podcast. And you, Chris, you're going to have to tell John to listen to this episode now because, of course, because John, what Ezekiel wanted for Christmas, and I totally forgot to ask you for this, is he asked if I would get a cameo from you. And if you're not familiar, everybody, what cameo is, it's like celebrities will do like a little video and like talk to a person. And so, John, you are Zeke. He's like, you're his idol when it comes to podcasting. He loves to listen to the Chris and Christine show and he absolutely loves the Basement Surge podcast and you would make his day to be able to like chat with you or be on your podcast because he thinks that it is so fantastic and so do we. And so we're looking forward to seeing our friends, John and Heather, when we come back out to the East Coast again. And, you know, that's what this podcasting community is all about. It's about helping each other pursue our passions and encouraging one another in, you know, building up something that we're really proud of, especially if our career isn't the end all be all for us. It's giving ourselves the opportunity to pursue our passions. Right, Chris? Absolutely. I think people confuse their careers with their life, you know, like, right. Like they go into career. And so, so that all they think about and breathe, you know, do everything you do is, is focused on, that one thing and there's more to life than just work (laughs) right and so you got to find something that you enjoy doing as well and it's okay if the job that you're in right now doesn't feel like it's your destination it's a spot along your journey and so the question is like what is it that you can learn and uh, what skills can you cultivate and talents and abilities where you're at right now so you can keep growing and I think that that Anthony really talked about that and so you know, whether you want to learn more about Anthony services or you want to learn more about podcasting services, you can learn more about us and our guests where, Chris? On our website, which is chrisandchristineshow.com. And we appreciate you listening in. We're going to be back with you soon talking all about the new year, new you, and everything that's in store in 2024. Right, Chris? Absolutely. And we'll be back with you next, next week. week.